Hello my friends, welcome back. I'm JC and this is Grace Overflowing. In today's video, I have a lot to share with you guys. Um, just things that the Lord has been showing me. There's been a lot of dreams and there's been a lot of seeking and searching out in scriptures as it relates to this topic of the JAB, specifically as it relates to the MOTB. Now, if you have followed my channel for any period of time, you know that I have been very vocal about this from very early on about how the Lord had shown me in dreams, but also in scriptures that this is not for the body of Christ, that it is not only a huge idol, but also very, very dangerous. And I believe that there will be consequences of those who, whether knowingly or not, bow down to this idol and worship this golden calf that is in our land. But with that said, I want to communicate that I have continued to wrestle with this subject. I have continued to seek the Lord on it as it relates to its finality. I mean, what it really means in the big picture. I've wanted the answer, the final answer. And as I have looked around at other brothers and sisters in some of these messages, I have just felt that none of them were sufficient. And, you know, honestly, I felt burdened and um, troubled by, you know, a lot of these varying messages. And I've just been asking the Lord to show me another option. Like, what could it possibly be if not any of these? And I want to go ahead and speak into some of these ways of approaching this subject just briefly. So we've got those that are just saying it's not the MOTB, you know, encouraging people to take it. And a lot of these pastors and leaders within the church and community are taking it. We know that this thing is in churches and um, churches are a distribution center. So obviously, based on what the Lord has shown me, based on the truth of scripture, we all know that is in error. But another way that many look at it is that it is the MOTB, the biblical MOTB, from which there is no spiritually coming back from. It's a done deal. These people are lost forever. They are damned for all eternity. And even though I do believe from my own personal study of scripture that those who take the MOTB, that that is true. That is what the scriptures say. I have had a hard time, even though I have studied this thing out, and even though all of the parallels and ways that we can see this actual product, this arrow, if you will, the parallels and how that's playing out and how it's biblically shown, even in the book of Revelation, I have still had a hard time swallowing this message, especially as I have looked at, you know, certain people who have spoken about it, speaking to people who have contacted them with some sort of desperate message, like, I have done this and I am remorseful. I am upset and scared. Is there any help for me? And these pastors are very boldly sharing that they have told these people, no, there is no hope for them. And so obviously that has been troubling in my spirit. And in the third and final way that I believe this subject is being handled within the body of Christ is that there are some that are saying that it is the, meaning singular, right? Because, you know, it doesn't say marks. It says the mark. So they're saying that it is the mark, but they're also saying that repentance is possible. And to me, my friends, in my study of scripture, that has seemed like an oxymoron. That does not seem possible that it could be the singular MOTB and yet not be final. That seems to contradict itself. And so as I have wrestled with this, the Lord has given me a lot of dreams, as I've said. And what's interesting is he had even given me a dream that conveyed to me that instead of just telling me the answer, he wanted me to find the answer. And what's really, truly amazing, my friends, and has just really blown my mind, but yet has created such an influx of information that it's even hard for me to be here and share it all, is that he has given me these hints in dreams. You know, he could tell me point blank. He could appear to me in a dream. I know he could and say it is or it isn't, explain the whole thing. But he has been leading and guiding me in such an amazing way and in such a wonderful way, in a way that only he could, that I am here before you to say that I believe that I have found 
scripturally that these people that are going this road, I do not believe that, again, this is me putting all of this together, all that the Lord has shown me, and me making a conclusion. I do not believe that these people who have taken this are doomed forever. And therefore, I believe that from a scriptural standpoint, we cannot call it the, meaning singular, biblical, M-O-T-B. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to walk you down one road that the Lord sent me down, and I'm going to show you how he revealed this to me and showed me this in scripture and what I ultimately have come away with, my friends, that I hope to explain at the end, that these people are worshiping an idol, and I believe that they are worshiping the image of the beast in that they are allowing their temples to be desecrated. I do believe this is an abomination. Biblically, there's no doubt about that. In the scripture, it says anything that is exalted by man is an abomination to God, unless that thing is God. And we know that people are not calling on a savior, the savior, Jesus Christ. People are not as a country, as a nation. These states are not seeking the Lord for a cure. They're seeking the work of man's hands. And so it is an abomination. So the book of Daniel says desolations are decreed. And so what I'm here to tell you is that this could be the abomination that makes desolate. It could be an abomination that makes desolate. There could be other layers to this thing. So with that said, I just want to make clear where I'm going with this is that there is a difference between the mark of the beast and the abomination that makes desolate. There are many people who are out there teaching that they're one and the same. And I have ultimately questioned that very same thing. So I'm not here to um, put myself above those people because I have seen where it could be true. But as I have dug deeper, as the Lord has led me, I feel I have found proof that they are two separate things. And I hope that I will be able to explain that to you guys today and give you enough to at least see where I'm making this declaration in terms of my own personal belief. So with that, I want to start by sharing a story that was sort of a supernatural leading. You know, I had been wrestling with this subject for a long time, as you know, and one day in particular, I had laid down, I had taken a nap, and I had been doing a lot of studying during these times. It was around Thanksgiving, the Thanksgiving holiday, and I woke up and I had a statement in my mind, and it was life is in the blood, which we know is scriptural. And then the number 417 came into my mind. And it was just kind of one of those unexpected things. Like I didn't remember a dream at all. It was just, I woke up and had these two details firmly in my mind. And so I ended up starting to look through scriptures, trying to track this down and found that this number 417 lined up with scripture that I believe spoke into this subject of the mark of the beast so perfectly that I was just completely astounded. And that is Deuteronomy 417. And so I'm going to read this from the King James Version. And what's interesting about it is that I had just started using the King James Version, and there is a big difference. I love my ESV, and I still go there all the time. I use it all the time. But what's interesting is the way that the King James Version uses certain words that tie certain scriptures to other scriptures in a way that none of the other translations do. And that is the particular truth of this verse. So I want to begin by explaining a little bit of what Deuteronomy 4 speaks into. Starting at verse 15, it is essentially a warning against idolatry. And as I said, I had received the number 417. So chapter 4, Verse 17 says, The likeness of any beast that is on the earth, the likeness of any winged fowl that flieth in the air. Now, it's talking about the creation of idols. And unlike any of the other translations, it refers to, you know, these creations 
as a beast in a way that supernaturally, obviously connected to Revelation 13. And so that got my attention in a big way, my friends. And so I read the entire thing for the purpose of this video. And because I know that it's going to be a little longer, I'm not going to read the whole thing. But what I'm going to try to do is just summarize that it goes through the list of, you know, what these idols are. It warns against them. It talks about consequences of them. But then what is really interesting, my friends, and where the Lord really got my attention is where it talks about God's loving mercy as it relates to these idols. I mean, if you think about it, man has always worshiped idols ever since the very beginning. And ultimately we see a worship of an idol. But yet I believe that the Lord was even trying to show me here through the scripture that the mark of the beast must be something more. And so this is what it says beginning in verse 28, and there ye shall serve God's the work of men's hands, wood and stone, which neither see, nor hear, nor eat, nor smell. But if from thence thou shalt seek the Lord thy God, thou shalt find him, if thou seek him with all thy heart and with all thy soul. When thou art in tribulation, and all these things come upon thee, even in the latter days, if thou turn to the Lord thy God and shalt be obedient unto his voice, for the Lord thy God is a merciful God, he will not forsake thee, nor destroy thee, nor forget the covenant of the fathers, which he swore unto thee. Now, when I read this, the first thing that came to my mind is that God never changes. And here it seems that he is making a promise that as it relates to idolatry, which we know the human heart is prone to, my friends, we have all had idols, whether we want to believe that we have or not. We are all sinners in need of a savior. We are human. We are of the flesh. And God knows this about us. And so what was interesting is how this verse 17 seems to connect this image, right? And let me read from the beginning, um, starting at 15, just to give you some context, because it's important. It says, Take ye therefore good heed unto yourselves, for ye saw no manner of similitude on the day that the Lord spoke unto you in Horeb out of the midst of the fire, lest ye corrupt yourselves and make you a graven image, the similitude of any figure, the likeness of male or female, the likeness of any beast that is on earth, the likeness of any winged fowl that flieth in the air. And so many of us that have realized that this is an abomination that is making desolate, and many of us that have been looking into the reality of transhumanism and AI and even CRISPR technologies that splicing the DNA and ultimately changing people into something that God did not create and God did not call good, we have been able to see that there is something there and it's connected to all of this very obviously. But what's interesting is that in verse 16, it even says, lest ye corrupt yourselves and make you, make you. And obviously in this time, it was referring to something wooden or graven but it just seems interesting that we have now realized that there is the possibility of making ourselves into the image of the beast by allowing the beast and the beast system to corrupt our DNA. So there seemed not to be any mistake that the Lord had given me this information and how it ultimately not only spoke into that time and that place, but it says when you find yourself in tribulation. And we know that that is the exact word that the word of God uses as it relates to what is coming on the earth at the end and when people will be tried and tested. And it says, even then, even in the latter days, if you turn and you call out and shall be obedient, that the Lord your God will not forsake you or destroy you or forget the covenant that he has made with your fathers. And so that really, really, really got me thinking, you guys. And as it relates to the concept of life is in the blood, you can go through and research some of that. But, you know, ultimately what I feel and how the Lord revealed to me, he was speaking to me through the combination of these 
scriptures and that statement is that it's the physical life. The physical life. You know, I believe right now the physical temple is being desecrated. It is being destroyed. Do I believe that this thing is going to make it harder for people to connect to the Lord? The more of this thing that goes in, it seems to be driving the Holy Spirit out, grieving the Holy Spirit. But yet none of us know at which point it has gone to a point where that Holy Spirit, the Lord Jesus that lives inside of us, has been grieved to a point to where he ultimately leaves. We know that is possible because the scripture tells us that it is possible. You know, you cannot continue to sin unrepentantly and expect that the Spirit of the Lord be able to live in that because that opposes God. And God is truth and God is good and God is righteous and His Son is and He cannot live in those conditions. Not that He doesn't love the person who is doing these things, but it is just not the ways of God. What I believe that this is showing me and what I think I have connected also as it relates in the book of Revelation chapter 13 is that these people are being deceived. And I think that that is what the deception largely is speaking to because is it the MOTB? You know, I don't think so, but it is very highly connected and it is leading up to, and I believe that it is part of the process that is going to make those people freely do whatever it is that I think ultimately will be this nail in the coffin, if you will. And Ultimately, at that point, would be the blasphemous act from which this scripture would no longer apply. We know that Jesus spoke that the only thing that couldn't be forgiven of is blaspheming the Holy Spirit. And so I believe that the Lord has shown me that in the case of the MOTV, there must be blasphemy and it is permanent and even something that is more obvious. You know, I'm not going to say it's as obvious as the nose on your face. The devil is sneaky. And I've said from day one, you know, all of this seems like it could totally be all of his way deceiving through Big Pharma all these years to be able to get to this point. And so I do believe that there is deception. And I do believe that by taking this thing that is ultimately worshiping the image that one thing leads to another, but I do not believe that it's final. Now with that, I want to point out just a couple of things as it relates to Revelation 13 that's important. So the first part as it relates to the first beast, what's interesting about it is that it speaks to blasphemy, blasphemous names, blaspheme, you know, all of these blasphemy type of words four times. And what is interesting as it relates to the second part of Revelation 13, as it relates to the second beast, also four times it is speaking of the word image. Okay. Now, if you read beginning in verse 14, it says, and by the signs that it is allowed to work in the presence of the beast, it deceives those who dwell on earth, telling them to make an image for the beast that was wounded by the sword and yet lived. And it was allowed to give breath to the image of the beast so that the image of the beast might even speak and might cause those who would not worship the image of the beast to be slain. Now, another thing that I think is super significant that the Lord has shown me, I have looked into this word slain. If you look it up in Strong's Concordance, what you will find is that it points to a killing off. It says to basically die in any possible way. A lot of people want to read into the scripture and say that it, there's beheading going on, that there's some uh, kind of FEMA camp type of death being had here by these people. But at least in this particular chapter, in this particular verse, this text does not read that way. Furthermore, I had found on another website where it has more of an in-depth uh, look at some of these words and explanation. And what I found that this word slain doesn't necessarily even mean to be killed in the moment. It's more of a be condemned to death. And if you put this 
in the context of what is going on right now as it relates to these people who are not bowing down and who are not taking the you know what. You know, essentially all of us unvied are what? We're being condemned to death. People are saying, you know, Biden just had a message giving a very strong warning and almost speaking a curse over anyone who doesn't do this, basically proclaiming death over them. And I just think that that is super interesting. And furthermore, what I found, and I'm going to go ahead and read from this uh, website, it says, you know, our verb, catino, most literally speaks of excommunication, a severance from the society that gives identity to all of its people. This is precisely what makes the expulsion of Adam and Eve from the Garden of Eden so horrendous because with their expulsion, their dying started. So they didn't physically die right away. And I just think that's really interesting when you apply some of these deeper concepts to this word and what it could potentially mean and how we who are unveed are essentially severed from society. And so going on from there, it says also it causes all, both small and great, both rich and poor, both free and slave to be marked on the right hand or on the forehead so that no one can buy or sell unless he has the mark that is, the name of the beast or the number of its name. This calls for wisdom. Let the one who has understanding calculate the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man. And we talked about in a previous video, that's just man. And his number is 666. So with all that said, looking into this verse, Revelation 13, verse 16. What I found was interesting by looking into this website that I mentioned. Again, I believe it's Eberim publications. I will put that link in the description box connecting to Revelation 13. So if any of you all want to look into any of this, you can. But as it writes that scripture, that complete text for Revelation 13 verse 16, it shows the word and used six times. And again, we know we have all these different translations, but I believe when we look into the actual translation and how it would be written and how it would be said, I think something like even the word and used six times must be significant. And so this is what I found about the word and. It says and Kai, K-A-I, is altogether not very exciting either. It's mostly used to tie words or statements together in much the same way as does our English word and. But on occasion, it's used to stress addition or add emphasis. And it also shows um, a couple of verses where this word and is used in this way for emphasis. And I just felt that if one passage, one verse uses this word and six times, perhaps if this word can be used on occasion to stress addition, then possibly we could read the same into it, that it's more than just the word and, meaning in addition to. It's and being stressed. And that's where, my friends, I want to speak to this also, because that is listed as an and, okay? Also, in scripture, it seems to show that there are two totally different things. There are the worshiping of the beast and also the taking of the mark. And if you want to follow me now over to Revelation 19, verse 20, it says, And the beast was captured, and with it the false prophet, who in its presence had done the signs by which he deceived those who had received the mark of the beast and those who worshipped its image. And so what I believe the Lord is showing me is that all of the people that are worshiping this image, you know, and allowing their temples to be defiled and become desolate. All those people have not been made desolate yet, and that ultimately there is still hope for them unless they do this other thing, take this mark. It's not one or the other. It's potentially in that case, both. There is a differentiation here. Those 
who received the mark of the beast and those who worshiped its image. Furthermore, chapter 14 gives us another example where it seems that both are required. And this is what it says as it relates to the angels. The first angel basically says the time of judgment has come. The second says fallen is Babylon. The third says if anyone worships the beast and its image and receives a mark on his forehead or on his hand, he also will drink the wine of God's wrath poured full strength into the cup of his anger. And so what I'm here to tell you, my friends, is that you know, you could potentially argue with me and say, no, it's one and the same. But I tend to think that if you can read these scriptures and if you can find a way of looking at it that gives hope, meaning there is no way that you could potentially read these scriptures and say 100% that salvation is not possible for the people who are obviously making this grave error, worshiping this idol. But I believe, based on Deuteronomy 4, that we can believe that God is true to his word, that ultimately we have been worshiping idols for a long, long time. Something else has to happen. And I do believe that there will be something that is more significant. I also believe that as it relates to the mark of Ezekiel 9, angels applied that mark. And so it just burdens me and I feel the need to warn against anyone making any kind of proclamation or declaration over someone's eternity. I believe as Christians, when we make this call, we are putting ourselves in the place of God. We know that ultimately these people will stand before God and he will judge them based on their life. And, you know, we are not in the position to do that. And so until the Lord comes to judge and until they're standing before him, I just don't think that we're doing anybody any favors by calling it the mark or by telling people who have taken it that have come to us to seek some sort of hope that there is none, that they're damned. I truly believe, my friends, that that is as much of a grave error as taking the serum itself. And I believe that if anyone has done that and said these things to anyone, that they are in need of repentance just as much as the people who are taking this is. We have to be very, very careful because the enemy is smart. And I believe a lot of times he's going to be getting people on both sides of this. And he's the one who divides. We have to remember that he is the one. And if he can get us to think in our minds that these people are lost and not talk to these people about repentance, especially if they come to us with a convicted heart. If anyone comes to you with a convicted heart, we know there must be some element of spirit there because, you know, the enemy isn't going to convict them against taking this thing if this is his offspring. You know, the Bible tells us a house about it against itself cannot stand. Why would Satan all of a sudden convict a heart on having partaken of his particular poison? So if these people are having uh, remorse, then we know there is hope for them. We know that the Spirit of the Lord is speaking to them, and we need to encourage repentance and offer hope because as long as Jesus is uh, in heaven sitting at the right hand of the Father, there is hope. Now, in closing, I want to offer one last thing for those people who are just hell-bent on no, 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 no. This is the absolute, the one and only, the final nail in the coffin mark you know, I want to say this. The Lord had brought to my mind the notion of it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to get into heaven. And the disciples asked about it. And he said to them, with man, this is impossible. But with God, all things are possible. Yes, my friends, these people are desolating their temple. They are corrupting their flesh. I think that they are harming their physical bodies. And thus is what I think the Lord was telling me in that word about life is in the blood, the physical life. But we are spirit, the Holy Spirit, Jesus is spirit, and we are spirit. And I just believe that God is greater right now. I do not believe that the enemy has been cast onto the earth. I do not believe that he has been given full authority. And until then, my friends, until Satan is cast down. 
as long as Jesus is in the heavens and that dispensation period of grace hasn't ended, and I believe something more than what's already happening happens to where you know it seals the deal, it is that nail in the coffin, then we have to have hope. Because when we take hope away from these people, you know, we are taking God off the throne, essentially. And with that, I want to just say also that we have to think about this cure as it relates to other cures. There's a lot of people out there that are just totally warring against that thing because it's evil, all the while saying we're going to put our hope and our faith in God, endorsing another savior. Let's just say this is the front door and people are endorsing pharma products on the back door, whether that be Ivermectin or the antibodies. And from what I understand, my friends, there's a lot of questionable stuff going into that as well. And so we're talking about four shots in the stomach. We're talking about three shots in the arm. As it relates to worship, you know, obviously one is potentially changing your situation more than potentially another, but who knows? Who really knows? I had a friend who looked into the antibodies and found that, you know, Chimera and some of these other questionable things are going on there too. And furthermore, I had come across a very convincing, very scientific and official looking YouTube page where this guy was talking about a study in Sweden that showed that not only does the flying V with the spike proteins ultimately have access to the nucleus, which ultimately could change the DNA, but that the virus itself, my friends, is able to do this because of the spike protein. So I just wanna say that the enemy is real. And I believe this is a very real bioweapon. And I believe that the enemy is trying to destroy us in all ways. And you know, you can't just isolate this one thing as a, oh, worship, if you're not gonna say any of this form of worship, you know, meaning big pharma worship, or if it's truly a matter of like, okay, well, the DNA is potentially being changed. Well, what does that mean for those people that have gotten the virus and this virus has attacked their cell nucleus and has gotten in there and has ultimately led to potential changes too? And so with all of this, my friends, and there's more, there's a lot more, but with all of this, I just wanted to bring it before you today for consideration. I want to offer you hope if you have taken this thing and if you have been burdened, if you have been um, heartbroken over it, if you have been just ripped apart by this thinking that there's no hope for you, you know, I want to encourage you not only that there is hope, but to repent and seek the Lord with all of your heart. You know, I believe that the word of God is cleansing. And what I believe is that this temple has been defiled if you have taken it. And so just like when the second temple was taken over by Antiochus Epiphanes and the Holy of Holies had been desecrated with unclean uh, sacrifice and when the Maccabees took it back over, what did they do? They lit that candle. They lit the menorah and there was a supernatural work that happened. One night worth of oil turned into eight nights. And what was that, my friends? That was a vision of the way that the Lord was consecrating that space. The light was burning off all the impurities, all that had been done within that space. There is nothing that the Lord God cannot do. There is nothing that the fire of the Holy Spirit, no impurity, no even corruption, no change that the Lord God and his perfect fire cannot burn away. And so I just encourage you to seek the Lord and put the word of God, which is cleansing to the soul. It is literally like pouring the spirit into your body. Consume the word of God. Pray fast. Really seek the Lord on this. And ultimately, if you have been of the mentality that this is a final thing, I just ask that you pray about it. You know, go to the Lord, consider all this and ask the Lord about it.
Okay, my friends, this video has gone long again, and if you've watched and you're still with me, then I appreciate that. If you have any comments or questions, definitely leave them in the comment box, and I'll try my best to answer them. But otherwise, I just ask you to seek the Lord on all of these things. I am not claiming anything absolute, but I do believe that there are greater truths that we must focus on. And what I believe the greater truth is, is that we are at the door. I believe believe the Lord Jesus is coming for his people. I believe that we are on the verge of rapture. I believe that all of these signs and all that is going on on earth, whether it be, you know, these mandates and as it relates to this jab and as it relates to all of these environmental things that are happening, these tornadoes that hit Kentucky. And as a side note, just wanted to thank anybody who reached out. We were fortunate that we live in Lexington and there was no storm damage here that I'm aware of. And so we are totally fine. I appreciate anyone checking in on us. But yeah, those poor people in Mayfield and really all over the earth, you know, there are things happening, tornadoes, crazy weather. The signs are there, my friends. We are there. And so I just ask you to stand strong, putting your hope and faith in God, not allowing the enemy to steal your faith and not allowing the enemy to take God off the throne. We are still in the church age. And as long as we are, we are in the time of grace. And so with that, I hope that it encourages you, especially if you have been like me and have really been burdened about all the people that are being deceived right now and gives you a reason to have hope for them, not only to continue to pray for them, but also to reach out to them and encourage repentance. And especially if anyone comes to you with the realization that they have made a mistake, to feel free to encourage them into repentance, putting your hope and faith because we walk by faith, not by sight. You know, so some of this, there is some unknowns. Even if we study the scripture, I think, you know, our whole lives, it's like in the flesh, there's so much here. You know, God is greater. He is beyond us. We as the flesh man could never understand all of what it is that this Bible, you know, the word of God, which is God, what it is and what it's capable of because he's just so big, my friends. And so I just want to encourage you not to make our God small, to have hope because hope is found in Jesus. My friends, until next time, may the Lord bless you and guide you and fill you with his perfect grace overflowing.